Hello and welcome to the EDH Fretcast. My name is Joseph Schultz and I am joined as always by my fantastic co-hosts. First up, the fellow who thinks the purpose of a forest is for rest. That's Matt Morgan. Joey, did you hear about the semicolon that broke the law? I did not. It was pretty bad. It was given two consecutive sentences. Uh, <laughs> Your dad jokes, as always, are splendid, Matt. Next, the guy who was delighted to discover that an island is land. That's Dana Roach. Joey, if this podcast had a keyword, do you know what it would be? I don't. What's that? Eminence, because we're getting worked on out of the command zone. <laughs> Ooh. Good call. Well done. And indeed, we have to give an enormous thanks to Josh LeQuay and the whole team at the Command Zone. They are now handling the post-production work on our podcast. So we are the EDH Rutcast, brand new and improved. And we are so excited about this amazing development. Folks, if you are just a regular podcast listener, you are going to want to tune in on the YouTube because things have been improved to such a high level of quality. They do an amazing job there. And we are so excited about this development and that we are able to share it with you. But I haven't even finished the introductions yet. I'm sorry. This is the EDH. EDH RecCast. EDH Rec is a deck building website that collects data from deck lists all over the internet to provide helpful recommendations for new commander decks. And here on the podcast, what we'd like to do is to give all of that data a little more context. Before we actually get to our main topic, we have one other shout out that we have to do, and that is for Card Kingdom. EDH Rec is sponsored by the wonderful Card Kingdom, and you can visit their site, cardkingdom.com slash EDH Rec, to let them know that you listen to our show. Card Kingdom is one of the sites that helps provide up-to-date pricing information on EDH Rec, so you can check on card prices while you're using the EDH Rec website to build your newest deck. And I also gotta be completely honest, I love Card Kingdom because they are my local game store, and I just I can't recommend them here enough. They've been an amazing godsend to have here in Seattle. And podcast fans who listen to a lot of Magic content will probably know that a lot of other podcasts that are also sponsored by Card Kingdom really love them because of their legendarily fast shipping. And I can absolutely confirm this. It is legendary fast shipping. If their shipping was a creature, it could be your commander. That's how legendary it is. <laughs> So again, that is cardkingdom.com slash EDH rec. And guys, it's so exciting that we are past episode 100. We're on to episode 101. So now I want to ask, what is going to be our topic here on episode 101? We're going to go back to basics. And by that, I do not mean the card because that would be rude. But we're going to go back to basics in that it is episode 101. So we're going to cover some 101 level topics. Talk about all the things that we kind of take for granted and we haven't talked about because it is episode 100. So let's revisit some of those old classics. Right. And it's very much the EDH rec essentials. We're going to be talking about some of the foundational concepts that we've discussed here on the podcast and some things that you might hear us talk about in future episodes as well. So we've got a couple of different things that we think are really foundational and really important, both when you're listening to the podcast, but also when you're interfacing with EDH rec and maybe some tips on how to use a little better and how to engage with the data that you see on EDH rec just a little bit uh, better to help both acquaint new listeners of the show with some of the concepts here, but also to help anyone who's just trying to make a better deck. That is what EDH Rec is all about. It's helping you find good cards and improve the recommendations for the decks that you build so that you can play an amazing game of Commander. Our first topic that we're going to be discussing, a really big foundational piece of, uh, of EDH Rec. In fact, it was the topic of our first episode on the EDH Rec cast. We are talking about the precon effect, which is not nearly as complicated as it might actually sound at first. But basically, this is a way that the data is sometimes influenced on EDH Rec based on the cards that existed in the pre-constructed deck for certain precon commanders. So the basic cycle of a precon effect sort of goes a little like this. A player buys a pre constructed deck, then they change maybe a few cards and then put that list of the new deck that they've just modded a little bit. They put that list online where EDHREC then scrapes that data and shows a high popularity for all of those cards because we're getting a bunch of that information, scraping all of that data from all of those awesome deck building websites. But since the list sort of looks a little bit similar to the original precon, we tend to see an aggregate of a lot of popularity among those cards that originally began in the precon. 
even though they aren't necessarily cards that might have made the final cut if you had been building that deck from scratch. And that is one of those things that we sometimes observe here on EDA Trek, where you can see cards that have a high popularity because they started in the original deck. And in fact, one of the other things that we want to make sure that we note about here isn't just that it's because those cards came in the original precon, it's also sometimes because it can create a bit of a feedback loop. Dana, do you mind telling us a little bit about what I mean by that whole feedback loop thing? Because it sounds kind of weird when I say it like that, like I'm a website person, but I'm not supposed to be. <laughs> sure. So <laughs> the loop kind of happens when players want to build that particular deck and they go to each rec for recommendations for that deck and they see a lot of players are running some random card from that precon. So then they assume, well, that must be a good card in that deck, so I'm going to go pick it up, which then adds one more deck to the database that's running that card from that precon. So it kind of then causes a loop where because it's in those decks, people see it and add it to their deck, which creates more decks with that card. And, and I can give you a good real world example that happened to me when I was first building um, whatever deck it was, it wasn't even important. I, I tried Temple of the False God in, in several different decks and I was never really happy with it. It, it burned me multiple times. And at one point in time, I remember checking EDH Rec, I'm like, how popular is this card? Because I don't have good luck with it, but I see it in a lot of decks and I check EDH Rec and it's in, you know, 100,000 decks, whatever it is. I'm like, oh, well, it must be good. Maybe it's just me. So I kept running it for, you know, a year or so despite getting burned because it was in a ton of decks. And the reason it was in a ton of decks is it's in every precon. So yeah, th that feedback loop did occur and did actually hit me. Yeah, so a good example of this a deck that I love personally a whole lot, it's Mary Weatherlight Duelist. So Mary's that three mana legendary cat that came in the Feline Ferocity deck a couple years ago, which was all about cats. And it was a great Selesnya commander. But when you look at the average deck on EDH rec, there's a lot of cards that came in the precon, stuff like Jedit O'Janan of Afavra. It shows up in 42% of decks there. Uh, Kemba Ka Regent, another cat tribal deck, or card, I should say, 43%. And over 50% of Miri decks are playing Kasali Slingers. Those cards aren't necessarily the best in Miri, but so many people are playing them because it came in the precon deck with Miri. It's kind of almost becomes kind of a, a self-fulfilling prophecy so that people see, well, there's a lot of cats, so this must obviously be a very good cat tribal commander. That's not always the case, though, because, you know, people are adding Regal Caracol, which, yes, would be great in a Cat Tribal deck. And in fact, it's showing up in over 54% of Cat Tribal decks on Miri's page. And so it almost becomes that self-fulfilling prophecy. Regal Caracol would, yes, be very, very good in a Cat Tribal deck, but people see Miri and see that all the pre-con cards that are in there and automatically assume Miri becomes then exclusively a cat tribal commander, which isn't always necessarily the case. Regal Caracol is in over 54% of Miri decks. That's just because people see it, and so that they therefore then believe that Miri is just a cat tribal commander. And, and she really isn't. Nothing about her abilities actually speaks to wanting Cat Tribal, but since she came in that Arabo precon, and Arabo is a Cat Tribal commander, we are seeing after effects of that. And that's not the only Cat Tribal card that shows up there. Pride Sovereign is another one that jumps out to me, right, showing yeah. up in 48% of the Miri decks. And it's like, again, these are good for Cat Tribal, but if Miri had been released in a different capacity if she wasn't in the cat tribal precon but if she had been in for example the set dominaria if that was where she'd been released i don't think anyone would think to make her a cat tribal deck because nothing about her abilities actually speaks to being cat tribal necessarily so that is a way that the precon effect sort of influences her page even to this day when she was released back in 2017 yeah definitely if if mary were the type of legendary creature that came in a pack of cards versus a pre-constructed deck I think the entire page would be different. All the high synergy cards would be very, very different as well because people would realize maybe this isn't exactly the best cat commander legendary creature around. Matt, right there, you just said the magic word synergy, and that can lead us into our next topic, which is the synergy rating, which is something we have on the website under each card, particularly each commander. And you can look at a card in EDH rec and see its popularity percentage. You know, X card is played in 45% of a certain commander's decks. But you'll also see a synergy score, and that takes into account the card's popularity for that particular commander's decks. So it subtracts from the average percentage of decks that can also play that card among commanders of the same color combination. 
That is one of the most important things on the site too, that we probably get the most questions about is what does the synergy score actually mean? And that exact formula that you just named is really what it's all about. It's not specifically saying that one card is the most synergistic and it has the actual best, you know, in gameplay, this is the best effect and this has, you know, 45% synergy or 80% synergy or, or whatever. It's not necessarily a comment on their gameplay. It's a comment on their popularity, that synergy score. And like you said, it takes their popularity popularity within this commander and subtracts from that the popularity of other of that card index of other commanders that are of that same color combination. So basically it's a measurement of a card's uniqueness. And a really good example comes from one of my personal favorite commanders, Feather the Redeemed, the Detective Angel. Gosh, oh, she's glorious and beautiful. Uh, there are like 1900 decks to Feather's name at this particular point, and a very high synergy card for her is the card Defiant Strike. Shows up in 90% of her decks, and it's got a 64% synergy rating. And really what that means is that it is 64% more unique than other Boros commanders, because other Boros commanders just don't tend to play Defiant Strike a whole lot. You can compare that to a card like Smothering Tithe, which shows up in over half of the Feather the Redeemed decks, and that's only got a 1% synergy rating. That's not to say that Smothering Tithe only has 1% synergy with Feather. It's an amazing card. It has amazing synergy with all of the white commanders, but it's not unique necessarily because a lot of other Boros decks are also running that card. So that is what's going on behind that synergy rating. Well, and one thing to keep in, you know, keep in mind, Joey, is you can have negative synergy scores as well. So you look at, you know, your beloved Feather, you'll notice that Sol Ring is played in 69% of Feather decks. That's actually negative 6% synergy. That doesn't mean that Sol Ring is not good in Feather decks. Far from the opposite. It's actually because the average deck, you know, 75% of all decks are playing Sol Ring. It's just that good of a card that so many decks are playing it. So when it actually comes in under that mark, it has a negative synergy rating because it's just not as popular, it's not as unique to Feather as the average deck. Exactly. So in short, a high synergy card is a really popular card that's really unique for that commander versus a top card that's popular to the commander, but it's also popular in all commanders of that color combination. Right, exactly. So a high synergy score doesn't mean the card is good necessarily, just that it's more unique. And a low synergy score doesn't mean it's bad necessarily, it just means it's not unique for that commander. Right, so this is actually a tool that Dana, I imagine someone like you who really enjoys more of the, uh, I guess I'll call them the hipster-y kind of decks, where you're looking for cards that are especially very unique, commanders that are very unique, and something that other players aren't necessarily doing. Those synergy scores might actually be a way for you to decide whether the strategy that you're pursuing for a certain commander is going to be a bit more unique than other commanders of that type. That's actually one of the things that makes Feather so appealing for for me, for example, because she has so many of those high synergy cards that are very different from other things that Boros players are doing. Or if I'm building one of my 18,000 different necromancy decks, I might be able to find some of the cards in there that have high synergy ratings that separate them from other Golgari decks that do that same thing. So that can be a way that you find cards that are a bit more unique within your 99, which I know is very important for you. Yeah, absolutely. It's a, something I use a lot. And, and even on our last show, um, when we had Sheldon Menry on episode 100, Sheldon talked about using that kind of thing a lot to see what doesn't get played more than what does get played for a certain commander. Yeah, exactly. There's also another really fun segment that we like doing it here on the EDH Repcast, and that is challenge the stats because there's a ton of information, a ton of data, a really a wealth of accumulated knowledge here on EDH Rec. But EDH Trek measures cards by popularity, and that means that sometimes we actually don't always agree with it. Sometimes we think that cards are a little too popular. Sometimes we think that cards are not popular enough and that they're very, very underplayed. As a quick caveat, in Challenge to Stats going forward, we may actually end up talking about some cards that we have discussed on previous Challenge to Stats in past podcasts. But the way that we look at it, it's been two years since we first began the podcast, and some of that data is still the same, which means that we still need to challenge it because some of these numbers need to move, some of these cards need to see a little less love, and some of them need to see a whole lot more love. So, Matt, I'm actually going to pass it off to you. What is a challenge that you've got for us this week? So this one we have done before, but it does bear repeating because the stats haven't really changed a whole lot on it, but I'm going to challenge Thunderherd Migration, which is a sorcery for one and a green, and as an additional cost to cast the spell, you can reveal a dinosaur card from your hand or pay an extra one, and then you search your library for a basic land card, put on the battlefield tapped, and then shuffle your library. 
So this is currently showing up in 43% of 2063 Gishath Sun's avatar decks. It has a plus 30% synergy, which is all well and good, but Gishath wants to be searching for these dinosaur cards from your library, not necessarily from your hand. I think that number, it might be a little overplayed. I, I think for the mana, for three mana to search out a basic, you can be playing Rampant Growth, you can be playing Farseek in Gishath decks. There are a lot of better options that are always going to cost you know, the, the one in green versus sometimes this card is going to cost two in a green. So it comes down a little bit slower. There's just more efficient options than Thunderherd Migration for Gishath decks especially. Yeah, very much. If folks are going hardcore into Dinosaur Tribal, then that's all well and good. But of the 2,000 Gishath decks, 40, 43% on Thunderherd Migration is really crazy, especially for a card that some of the time might just end up being worse than a regular old Rampant Growth. So just because the card says Dinosaur on it doesn't necessarily mean that it's the best for a Dinosaur Tribal deck. Exactly. Another challenge that I'm going to bring here is actually just a quick comparison between the cards Swords to Plowshares and Path to Exile. And to be clear, this isn't actually necessarily saying that Path to Exile is not seeing enough play. It is by far one of the most popular cards in the format. Specifically, the numbers on them, though, Swords to Plowshares shows up in 58% of all eligible decks that include white that EDH Rec is, you know, scraping all that data for. And Path to Exile only shows up in 29% of eligible decks that could run it. And that is a really important disparity to note. Path to Exile is a more expensive card than Swords to Plowshares, which has been reprinted a lot more and is a lot more easily available to folks. And a really big caveat that I really want to throw here is that like, you should absolutely play to your budget. But what I want to bring up with this particular challenge is just that sometimes there are other factors like the pre-con effect, but also sometimes just the factor of price that can affect the data here on the site because Path to Exile is just a little bit harder to actually you know, get your hands on than a card like Swords to Plowshares. So don't be tricked into thinking that Path to Exile is necessarily a worse card because it sees about half as much play as Swords to Plowshares. They're both primo removal for white decks. They're amazing. But the numbers are influenced by something beyond their playability and their efficacy. They are influenced by availability and price, which is a really important thing to know when you are looking at the data on EDH Rec. There's outside contexts that are informing those numbers. So that's a really important observation that we wanted to bring up for this show too. All right, Dana, hit us with your challenge. My challenge is one that I myself have brought to the show before. Uh, it's an instant from way back in Mercadia Masks block. Um, Mercadia's downfall, it's two and a red, three mana total. Attacking creatures get plus X plus O till end of turn, where X is a number of non-basic lands defending player controls. So it's basically an overrun in red. It's in a lot of cases better than an overrun, particularly if you're playing some kind of a token deck that doesn't have access to green especially. So like Edgar Markov or Matt's good buddy Valduke or basically anything that's gonna go wide, any of the ver Krenkel variants or, or Goblin tribal decks, Anything that goes wide that doesn't have access to green, it's a three mana kill target player spell very, very often as a combat trick. It's not ever going to be dead fairly frequently. It could be, you know, plus eight, plus O to all your creatures. It's just an absolute beating. And it's only in 80 some decks in EDH Rec. It's in, I think, 87 currently right now. So it's scarcely played, if at all. And Joey, you were talking about cards that maybe don't see play like Path to Exile because of their price, this is a card that I would wager doesn't see much play in large part because it's old and it's never had a reprint. So people don't know it exists probably. That's why you don't see this card in you know any more decks when it's an absolute house. Oh yeah, totally. And this is the kind of thing that maybe some data might accidentally yeah. bury a little bit. 87 decks total, not even 87 right. decks within a particular commander, just total. But this is an absolute beating because if there's one thing that idiot Trek players like it's some non-basic color fix and lands you bet this this almost turns into i know this is blasphemy I'm, I'm talking against one of my favorite cards it's almost a better version of triumph of the hordes if you're playing against people that just aren't playing enough basics like i always tell people to do they're going to get blown out by this card I don't know. The Triumph of the Hordes example is probably an incendiary thing to compare it to, but uh, what you are definitely pointing out is that this is going to deal a lot more damage to people than people necessarily think, and I can personally attest that I have been completely blown out by a surprise Mercadia's downfall. Because when I see three red mana open for someone, you know, when they're attacking me with a bunch of 1-1s, one I'm just like, what are they going to do? Trumpet Blast plus 2 plus 0 oh, and all attacking creatures? No problem. And then they're like, no, Mercadia's downfall. My creatures get plus 9 and you die. And it's like, oh no, that's 
bad. I mean, it's beautiful. It's really good. But for me, it's bad. Yeah, so our next topic that we're going to get into is the SALT score. So if you go to edhrec.com slash top slash SALT, that will take you to a very specific list where we actually polled a bunch of players. We got over 500,000 responses from people coming to the site where people graded all the cards that came up on a scale of zero to four. So zero would have represented, this card's fine. I see it. It's not going to affect me. I'm not going to get upset about it. Whereas a four means... This thing is a salt lick that you would give to cattle because it is that salty. <laughs> so like zero is a plane, four is an island. Exactly. Oh, wow. Exactly. <laughs> yes. And maybe like three would be swamp, two would be mountain. I think y'all are reading way too <laughs> yes. far into this. <laughs> but anyways, so if you look at any given card, you might see a little icon in the bottom left-hand corner of a little salt shaker. That means that that card had an exceedingly high salt score based off the responses that we got meaning it might frustrate people to see that card played in any given game, like an expropriate, for example, or if somebody's playing Leovold, they'll especially get salty, not just because it's banned, but because it's such a salty card. So many people said, yes, I don't really want to see this card, so I'm going to give this a four. Yeah, we got a lot of responses. And if you go to this salt page, you can even just Google and it should be one of the first things that comes up, EDH rec and the salt scores. You see a lot of cards that actually fit along those same lines. For example, I think one of the highest ones is the card Stasis, which got a salt score of 3.07. And this is the one that prevents people from, un from untapping. And then there's also the card Armageddon, which destroys all the lands, also got a really high salt score. Winter Orb is another thing that prevents people from untapping that got a really high salt score. You had mentioned the card card expropriate well that shows up at the salt score at a rate of 2.91 and remember these are ratings out of four so 2.91 out of four people really don't like it as much when you get to the expropriate level uh sort of stuff and actually rounding things out i'll go one further that's vornklex voice of hunger which also has a really high assault score you can see a lot of patterns about cards that people don't necessarily enjoy playing against very much because they maybe deprive you of resources or prevent you from taking your turns and someone else is taking a lot of extra turns that kind of deal people People really want to play in this very social game of EDH, but some of these cards aren't always going to be the most friendly thing that you can do, you know, for folks across the table. That's also just totally a thing that you can just talk about with your playgroup. For some folks, these are perfectly fine cards, but we did want to pull the community to see what the general consensus was about some of these cards. So that might actually be something that you can use when you are deck building to tell, is this a card that's going to be maybe a little dicey if I play it at the table, or is this a card that people are generally perfectly fine with if you were playing against a bunch of strangers at a local game store? This is another tool that can be used to help, you know, determine where you want your deck's impression to be basically. Well, and conversely, because we're trying to serve as many markets as possible, if you're a terrible person, you can use it to find a bunch <laughs> of cards to make everyone hate you too. So it, it, you can oh. use it that way. Yeah, I, I wouldn't go that far. I, I wouldn't go as far as Dana does. But if you want to just get a, a, a good good idea of how unfun a certain card is, this is a good way to do it. The higher, higher the salt score, the less likely people are going to be wanting to play a second game against that deck. <laughs> I, sorry, Dana, I just really love that. Like, this is something that people can use to avoid cards that other folks maybe don't like as much. But for you, you're like, but some men just like to watch the world burn. <laughs> I'm just a realist. <laughs> <laughs> Goodness gracious. There's one other point that we think is really important for us to uh, hit on here on episode 101, and that is simply what I personally consider to be the absolutely core foundational tenet of EDH Rack, of the podcast, the thing that, you know, when I come to EDH, this is my personal philosophy, and I think that like a, a lot of folks would agree to it too, and that is very much a philosophy behind the website, and that's simply that the data on EDH Rec is not necessarily prescriptive. All that EDH Rec does is measure the popularity of cards. It is scraping data from deck lists all over to see what a lot of people are playing. It isn't necessarily rating, you know, how good a card is in any given deck, which is why we challenge the stats here, because sometimes we think that popular cards are not necessarily as good and don't deserve to be played to that high a clip. But it also doesn't mean that you need to play the cards that other people are playing, because what we're doing here on EDH Rec is measuring the popularity of stuff, and that's a great crowdsourcing tool for us to find unique cards that work really well, you know, we're looking at cards across the entirety of the format, and this is a great aggregate to find those cards so you don't have to go digging through bulk bins and digging through a bunch of websites to find all of that information. But that doesn't mean that you need to play those cards just because they are very popular. EDH Rec's data is not prescriptive. It's EDH Rec for EDH recommendations, because these are just cards that you might enjoy playing, but don't feel pressured 
that you have to play them. This is a really big, important point for me, and one of the reasons why I love EDHRX so much. Yeah, it's a tool like any tool, and you can use it as often or as little as you would like, and in a lot of different ways a lot of times, too. Like if, if you're trying to build a deck that doesn't have a lot of overlap with other decks, you can use it that way to kind of build a unique deck. Or if, like you said, Joe, you're just trying to see what you forgot that people are, are doing with that commander that's popular, you can use it that way. There's just a whole lot of different ways you can use that tool. And it's pretty flexible to let you use as many ways as you want to. Indeed. Well, and one big thing too, with all the data, you might look at the average deck list and think, oh, the, you know, I can just go to EDH rec, pull the top cards for a certain commander and, and just put those cards into a deck. What you'll find a lot of times too is that's not a very cohesive deck idea. Sometimes you, you might come into conflicting strategies where different cards are, are battling for the top spots. Atraxa is one of the most egregious offenders of this because if you go to an Atraxa deck, you might see there's a lot of Planeswalkers, you might see there's a lot of plus one, plus one counters, there's a lot of infects. So there's battling strategies going on among different commanders that are gonna show up on the same page. So one of the big things you need to make sure you do is look at it with a critical eye. If you see the data, interpret it for yourself. Make sure that you're you're not just taking it blind because it's not meant to be taken as, as a hard, cold truth. It is be, you know, Joe, you put it really well, prescriptive. It's giving you suggestions and, and recommendations. It's not, this is it, this is the best way to do it because that's not what the data means at all. Not at all. Indeed, very much. And also, another thing that the EDHREC does is measure the most popular cards of certain types or the most cards of certain colors, the most popular commanders of the past week or of the past two years. And all that these are are just ways to not necessarily say, hey, these are the commanders that you should be playing or these are the cards that you ought to be playing. Like Dana loves to use it, these are ways to help you find things that are super popular. Because Dana, as I know for a fact, one of the ways that you use EDHREC is specifically to avoid the most popular stuff. Yeah, it's 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 not a list of cards that people should be playing. It's just a list of cards that people are playing. There's a very, very big difference because it's, you know, just because they are doing it doesn't mean they should be. Right. And, and in fact, I think it's always, I don't know, one of the, the most... Uh, Hilarious things to me. The guy who created EDHREC, our lord and savior, Donald Miner, his most popular, like the, the commander that he most frequently plays is Tanawa, which is a thing that phases your lands in and out. And it's a mono blue deck. And I don't even know if I'm actually pronouncing it correctly. That's how obscure <laughs> the card is. Uh, and like, that's what the guy who created the this particular website, which is all about measuring popularity. He goes for completely off the wall stuff as well. And that's just a really important thing to take home. I really enjoy finding commanders with really niche strategies and looking at the data to find cards that are really popular. And it is a great signal to me when other people are playing these cards that maybe I should look at it too. But Dana, you yourself mentioned the whole Temple of the False God debacle that you had and seeing something popular versus forging your own path is a really important point for you. And that's something that we wholeheartedly endorse here at EDHREC is using this data to bounce ideas off of just as much to get recommendations from. Well put. Exactly. Well, it is a little bit of a shorter show this week, but I think it was really fun to go back over some of these basic ideas like the precon effect or looking at stuff like the salt scores, things that are really important when you are going through EDHREC to help you evaluate that data more critically and see, you know, why, what, what is the why behind the numbers, basically. Let's put some extra context to those numbers. And that is our mission here on the EDHREC cast. And we are really excited about all of the uh, other episodes to come here in the coming days, too. Now that everything is spruced up a little bit, this has been a lot of fun and we are definitely looking forward to digging even further into the numbers and finding other fun revelations about the data that is all collected here. But I think for now, what we're going to do is call this episode to a close. Thank you guys so much for joining me. If folks want to find you online, get in touch with you, where can they locate you? Matt? So you can find me on Twitter and you can find my stream on Twitch. It's at Mathemus55. That's M-A-T-H-I-M-U-S-5-5. And Dana. You can find me on the Twitter birds at Dana Roach, and you can hear me on my other podcast, CMDR Central. And I'm Joey Schultz. You can find me at Joseph M. Schultz on Twitter. You can find the cast at EDH Retcast on Facebook and on Twitter. And if you have a question, a keen insight to our data, or maybe a challenge to stats pick of your own that you'd like to let us know about for a card that's really overplayed or super underplayed, a hidden gem of yours, you can contact us at EDHRecast at gmail.com. Huge, enormous thanks once again to Josh Lee Kwai and the whole team at the Command Zone handling our post-production and the work on the podcast. It is an amazing new look 
and we are so excited about this development. It is so much fun for us to bring all of this in a really jazzy way to our listeners. It's a really great development. And thanks again to our sponsor, Card Kingdom. If you want to get amazing magic cards, you can visit cardkingdom.com slash EDHREC to let them know that we sent you their way. And remember, they have that legendary creature fast shipping. We'll be back at you next week with more data and insights. But until then, remember, EDH wreck your deck before you wreck your deck. Thank you.